Okay, I'm gonna do a little bit of basing here. Got the kerns that uh, we did the basing on yesterday and it's dried out now. And uh, we're gonna do the uh, same treatment with those guys. So let's uh, put our brushes away here. Do a little bit of uh, organization here and then we can uh, get started. Literally left everything the same way you guys saw last night. And um, yeah, that was it, so. Okay, so we've got uh, the colors we're gonna be using for the basing here is uh, chocolate brown. Uh, we're gonna be using the middle shade. Where did it go? Dun, 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 dun. That's the War Master one. Oh, okay, how about the light shade? Let me find that one. Um, no, close, close, but no cigar. Oh, it was already out here, the middle shade. Okay, US Field Drab, that's the middle shade. And the light shade is, uh, it's called Iraqi Sand. Just gotta find out where it is. There's so many colors that are similar, but I wanna be consistent because it could make a difference. You don't want to have uh, one stand that's based differently than the rest of them. That would be an eyesore. So uh, let's go ahead and move this stuff here. Move this one over here. I just got in, folks. I've been out of town all day. So we went and, and these guys, so we can move on to other things. But let's, uh, let's move this. We're going to need these two. And... Where the heck is my Iraqi sand? Is it this one? Uh, nope, that's buff. Looks almost the same. Uh, okay. How about we worry about... Here it is. Ah, just when I was getting ready to give up. Okay, here it is, Iraqi sand. All right. And, um... Okay, Greg, hey, good morning, Greg, for you. Good evening for me. Decisions, decisions. Do I continue watching the Thursday night painting session or start watching this basing session? Well, it's your own fault for not being up to date. <laughs> you should be current. <laughs> Do whichever one you want. Uh, if it was me, I would, buy, I would watch this one live because what's gonna happen is after we film this one and it stops, and I suspect it's gonna be about an hour or so, um, you won't be able to see it again in, um, in the high definition for probably eight hours or so. So if it was me, I would just watch this one live. So, but you know, I'm a big fan of freedom. So do whatever you want. Uh, John Peter. Hello. Greetings, Tony back again. You've really been busy these last few days. Great. Absolutely. I want to power through this and, um, yeah, I want to get these guys done. We've got this painting palette that is, look how it's, as it's dried, it's kind of crinkled up. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to moisten this some more and uh, get this even. So we got to do, we got to do that. So let's go. I'll be right back, folks. Uh, I'll give you some background music for you guys to wait, but I don't really have that kind of set up. So I will be right back in a matter of, uh, say, 30 seconds. There we have it. Now, what I'm gonna do, this is a kind of a dry brush technique. So uh, the only reason I'm putting these, the paints on the palette is just so they, um, they live long enough to, uh, for me to um, handle them. But the first stage is gonna, that way, you, I, I mentioned this in another one of my videos, how long it takes to do this first stage. And it's really stupid long, um, but I'm not sure there's any way to get around it. But, um, you guys can see firsthand. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get a brush that is not stellar. 
We want to get one that has seen better days. And, um, you know, this one's not perfect. It's got like a little burst. Start uh, becoming uh, less, um, not to be as good a shape as before. They get moved to this stage and they get used for, for this purpose. So let's, um, let's mix chocolate brown from Vallejo. All right, this is the wrong side, but I don't want to keep reaching across here and try, hopefully not be as distracting. Okay, here we go. We're gonna use a fair amount of this. And normally if I was doing basing or any kind of terrain, I wouldn't be using these high dollar, low amount paints. I'd be using craft paints, but I want to make sure these don't scuff up or anything. So we wanna, the craft paints don't last uh, as long or as these. So we've just been doing this with, uh, with that. And since we decided to pick these three colors based on the Flames of War website suggestion, we want to use the same colors so that we have a similar thing. Okay, so we're just going to try to avoid the rocks and just paint this stuff on. And I'm going to water it down a little bit so that we get underneath here and don't have any spots where... Now, I'm going to see, I may not be able to paint this all the way through because um, normally my painting dries almost instantaneous. But I'm putting more paint on here than I would normally would on a figure because uh, I want to make sure that we get in all the little granules and we don't have a little spot here that pops and there's no color on it, so... want to avoid that. I would have been on earlier, but I was out of town. We were doing some uh, scalloping. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but uh, we uh, went out uh, maybe about an hour and a half away and uh, chartered a boat and uh, took some kids with us and spent some time on the water and got, um, I think between, we didn't get a really good haul because season's kind of dwindling down but um we got about 65 of them so that's what's being cooked right now by um the wife unit so she um she's the pro in the kitchen i would just uh, ruin things if i tried to uh partake in any of that it would be like her painting me cooking is like her painting actually she probably can paint better than i cook so i've um and it's interesting that um I came up with an, uh, an, an analogy of that when somebody was just was asking why I didn't cook. And I said, well, it just takes too long to do something that you're going to eat in just a matter of minutes. And then I realized, well, it's kind of like uh, my painting. I take forever painting, and some people just want to do the dip method and be done with it. And um, I want it to take a while because, uh, you know, but I don't eat my figures. You know, and then when I paint these guys, I don't have to. He's definitely the uh, the chef in the apartment, and uh, I get called in to mix drinks if uh, if we're having one of those t type of things. So uh, I do like the bartend, but cooking, nah, no thanks. Nope, I paint. So she goes out of town, and I just assemble the hell out of things: sandwiches, salads kind of stuff but sitting down and actual cooking nah not my thing just like some people don't paint they'd rather buy painted armies so I can't be good at everything folks I gotta leave something for somebody else <laughs> yeah don't start a cooking show you know what it would be kind of like uh, the Swedish chef if I did <laughs> I, uh, I do like to eat, obviously, uh, and uh, I do appreciate all the different levels of flavor, okay? So I think I would be good at it, but nah, it's too late in life to start that. This is not my thing. And all the cleanup, too. I don't have cleanup with the paint. I don't get any food. I don't get any paint on me when I'm when I'm painting. What you do when you're cooking? <laughs> I 
Anyhow, no, no worries of me doing a cooking show. You know, you shouldn't do things, well, you should do whatever you want, but I don't think you should do a show. You should, shouldn't do put material on your YouTube channel about subjects that you don't know quite a bit about because it's just kind of like foolish, you know. Um, not that everybody needs to be an expert, but, you know, there's people that have... Um, topics that they know a bit about and um, you know why not share them as long as you know what you're talking about so if you know you're if you know what you're talking about it's easy to talk about it if you don't know what you're talking about then you probably shouldn't be the spokesman for something so this one's actually going faster than I was expecting I don't like this step because it's just it's just dumb. I just feel like this is something anybody could do. I'm not interested in doing stuff that anybody could do. You know, it, it doesn't excite me. So. Yeah, we almost got that uh, Gallo Glass guy done uh, last night. What do I have left to do? Oh, I know what I got to do. I've got to put, um, we did that non oil wash and uh, I needed to wait for it to dry. So we're gonna do some, here he is right here, this cute little guy right here. So we're going to, um, we're gonna do some, um, painting some other of the, of the metal and bring that up a little bit and then, and then he'll be done. So, um, yeah, some solid foot types. As you guys know, or maybe you don't know, I like my solid troop guys on 15 millimeter deep stands. So there's a provision in DBA 3.0 to mount your guys on 20 millimeter deep things. My older armies are on 15s. I don't want to have to rebase them just for that. And I think it looks better. Yeah, it's just kind of a, can be a problem on the hill, but you know, a 20 millimeter deep stand is also a problem on the hill. I just prefer the way that they look on a 15 millimeter stand. They look denser. Okay, so they're more formed up, so to speak. So my preference is to um, to base them that way. And yes, I know it's kind of an inconvenience because they recoil and they don't line up with other guys when they recoil. But you know, I'm. I don't want to base units on 20 meter deep stands because of some gaming advantage. And like I said, I like how they look on 15s, but you know, you can base them on whatever you want. I mean, as long as it makes you happy, you know. Um, same thing, I think hordes can be on 30s and 40s. 30 mil would want fast hordes on a 40 by 30 and uh, solid hordes on the 40 by 40 just so they take up more space, so to speak. But, you know, it's good to give people choices, but, you know, just like I think you should be able to do whatever you want, I also don't take any crap from people. Hey, you should put them on the, on the 20 millimeter deep. How about let people do whatever they want, you know? Just like for the longest time when DBA 3.0 came out, you know, a lot of people didn't want to play because they didn't want to rebase their armies. I get that. It's a pain in the ass. And some sometimes some people have armies that are painted by um, a person who, you know, they can't replicate their painting style. So their army can't match up. And also sometimes, and this has actually happened to somebody that I know, they actually have an army that they purchased from someone and they can't just ask them to paint the other couple of elements for the 3.0 changes because the person's deceased. So now they've got an army that they can't use if we force them to abuse 3.0 games. So what we've always done is, uh, you know, if you have a 2.2 army and you want to play our 3.0 games, as long as it meets 2. Point, and obviously they will behave as they do in 3.0. So for instance, in 2.2, you might have a unit that can be either a three or a four auxilia. Okay, so it could be four figures on a stand auxilia or three figures on a stand auxilia. And as long as it's a legal 2.2 army, 
it still is going to behave like a 3.0 army just with those element types. So everybody wins. The people that are playing 3.0 are get to um, use an army that, uh, you know, when it's a four auxilia stand, it's going to behave like a four auxilia stand. And the people that have an army that is based to earlier standards can use that earlier army. Now, with the exception of one person that I know of who does not want to change some of their 2.2 armies to 3.0, everybody's building 3.0 armies in our group or that we game with. Um, I can play, I have several armies, I'm going to say six or seven, that are 2.0 armies and they either changed dramatically. Uh, in the case of my Gorio Korean, they used to be Book 276. Love that army. It's the first army I painted and won a tournament with. It's dramatically different. Um, and it's made with uh, figures that are no longer in production and can't be gotten because the guy who cast them is deceased. It's by a, a, a Frenchman named Alain Toulaire. And they're very beautiful figures, but they're no longer made. So in order to build that army, I basically have to um, reconfigure it severely. I'm just going to forget about them and just use them, leave them in my display case. I've probably played 40 or so games with them anyways. So um, if I decide to build them anyways, Kurosan makes some nice figures for that army anyways. So, um, But with the exception of one person, um, we all want to build 3.0 armies. I don't want to play any of my 2.2s anymore. Um, not because there's anything wrong with it, but especially if I'm making videos, I don't want to confuse folks, you know. Um, but yeah, there's a handful of armies. Right off the bat, I can tell you the two that change the most are this Kaguryo Korean that I have, and the other one. Which one changed? Which was the other one? I had it on the tip of my tongue. Oh, my Southern Dynasty is Chinese. Um, changed dramatically. When I built that army, I built it because I wanted a Chinese army. They had an elephant, okay? And that's the army that had the elephant. When 3.0 came out, they moved the elephant to the later Tang. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe uh, Phil Barker was having a born-again crisis or something like that. But anyhow, uh, they changed what the elephant is. So now I've got a... I've, I've got a my uh, Southern Dynasty Chinese into a, tang, a later Tang army. But uh, I just haven't done that. I've just, I'd rather just, instead of going retrofit something, unless it's something I'm dying for, I'm just going to keep moving forward and building new armies. But we don't discourage people from using 2.2s full set and say, you know, I'm not going to play 3.0 because you're going to make, you know, make me do this, that, or the other. Then that's kind of our philosophy. We don't have a problem with other people doing it. Um, no player in our group has uh, an army he happens to like, like to use quite a bit, which is uh, Shishia. Book three four book three sixty six and it changed dramatically in three point oh. Um I mean what I mean dramatically it's the old in two point two I believe they had like three knights, three light horse, three blades, three bows, and like a siloy or something like that. And now it has like a cataphract general, a cav, a light horse, two solid blades. I mean it's just totally different, you know. So you'd have to re completely redo that, that army. And um, he got his army painted by a painter who is not deceased, but is um, living under the largest rock known to man. He's just, he used to come over to our shows and he's just disappeared. And I, I think he's got some personal issues he's dealing with. But we haven't seen him in probably 10 years now. So, uh, you know, obviously he doesn't want to play that army in 3.0. But, you know, for the most part, we're all building 3.0 armies. Because for the most part, they're more, they, they, they have more options and they're, they're more fun. So, um, anyhow, we don't discourage other people if they want to use uh, older versions. So, John Peter, let's see what else you have to say. Uh, John Peter, if you're listening, you are from Germany, right? You're not uh, from. Uh, I think you're in uh, in Germany, which is uh, which is kind of cool because I think you're one of three people that I communicate frequently from Germany. So. Um, Frequently, meaning you comment on stuff like that, you know, so. Uh, okay, John Peter says, one thing I really like about the internet, specifically Facebook, 
I love Facebook because it's so easy to post pictures. Okay, that's that's number one. You know, I, I don't. I have a com home computer now, but I mainly use a phone, so it becomes very useful to post pictures and 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 answer questions and stuff like that on the phone. So, uh, specifically, Facebook is that I can ask the experts. I'm working on a samurai army that I bought 30 years ago. That I uh, wish this would. I wish the the chat wouldn't disappear. Uh, working on a samurai army that I bought 30 years ago, and that's not a period I know much about. And by asking the DBA crowd, I've gotten information that would take a long time to find. Ask the, uh, ask, ask the experts. And yes, you're from Germany. Ah, well, you know how I, if you watch my videos, which you have, I say the UK, the United Kingdom, is the land of toys. That's where all the miniatures come from. And contrary to, because you guys can't have everything, okay? Uh, you can't have the land of everything. You guys get the land of toys. Germany gets the land of beer. Okay, so my favorite beer is, if I had to pick one, plot, there's good beer from other places, but, uh, you know, you guys have uh, the, you guys have the market, in my opinion, on that one, so. Because people will say, you know, oh, I like Mexican beer. Well, what do you think Mexican beer is? It's Germans that went there and, and started the beer. Anyhow. It's okay to specialize, but uh, I don't know if there's any miniature makers of in 50 millimeter scale in Germany. If there are, I don't know about them. But I think you know, wargaming started in the UK, if if memory serves me right. So it would make sense that that's kind of, you know, where it comes from. So. All the people in the UK upset about the beer. Oh, we got good beer here. Well, every place has good beer. Well, almost every place has good beer. I know that in other other European countries that are not the United Kingdom, although I'm sure there are people in the United Kingdom that also do this, but it seems like the 172nd scale plastic figures, like uh, I'm going to say Italieri, for instance, um, and I can't think of any because I'm not really in the in the market for them. For like DBA armies are kind of popular, the plastic figures, um, and I can't think of who makes them because like I said I don't I like 172nd scale a lot all of my World War II stuff is exclusively in that scale I, I love that scale I just don't do DBA in that scale because all the people that um, that uh, in the group that I found out about DBA all did 15 millimeter scale so you have to supply figures for everybody so it doesn't really work that way but um, I know that um, I like 172nd scale for all the World War II stuff. Now, I don't paint flat plastic figures because I'm afraid of them being bendy. And although I grew up, the first figures I, I, I had as a kid were those old Airfix uh, 172nd scale um, sets, which had been rebranded. Because we're talking probably 1981, 1982, in my case. I know they came out much earlier than that. They were rebranded as um, MPC kits. Okay, And I don't remember what MPC stands for. But they used to have um, these little coupons on the side of them that, uh, I know I'm dating myself, but you, all you guys are much older than me. I looked at the demographics of people that watch my videos, and they're 10 years older than I am, but... You know, I'm on the cusp of 50, but even though I don't feel that way, but uh, I've been doing this for a while. So we're talking about early 80s, uh, MPC, they had a bunch of their kits that were, um, they were rebranded. And MPC is an American company. And they have these little coupons that depending on which kit you bought, you could mail order and get other, other free kits. So you'd have like the packs of like the 50 infantry if you were going to get um, Desert Rats in Africa Corps, German Mountain Troops, or... Um, or, or Russians, you know, American Marines, different kind of stuff, you know, plus some of the vehicles as well. 
the naval kits. You know, I had a Bismarck and a Graf Spee and uh, and a Repulse and uh, Exeter Ajax. You know, all those one six hundred scale. So, um, you know, in my early teens, I did all that stuff, and then uh, you know, without wargaming per se. And then I found out about wargaming, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is where it's all about right here. So now I got these kits you can build and use them in a real battle. So that's what I grew up with. But there are lots of people like uh, Russia, for instance. Russia, there's I think there's a club of people that play DBA in Russia, and they use uh, 172nd scale plastic figures. There's actually a decent variety of them. And they look good. They're more realistically shaped than these 15s or any of these. The, 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 the metal figures are more unreal. Um, but uh, there's a, uh, if you guys are into that, there's a excellent website called Plastic Soldier Review, I believe is what it's called. And that's kind of like the mecca for all, everything in that scale. And you can go and click on them and they can have, they'll show you like what's inside of each, of each package of how many poses of each one. It's really, really cool. It's really, really neat, you know. Because I do have some 172nd scale plastic figures for when I was doing skirmish. I just haven't painted them yet. But um, yeah, ever since I got bit by this DBA bug, I pretty much don't do any of the other stuff. But I have this dismounted Russian tank crew that I had to pick up. I saw them and I ended up having the street dismounted. You know, they're dismounted with like, you know, one of them's carrying that he pulled the whole machine gun out and he's carrying it like he's going to use it. And, uh, you know, a couple of guys with Pepe Shaws as well. Uh, tank commander with a pistol, that kind of thing. And, and a couple of the guys have, have, I could say they're Molotov cocktails, but they're not planning on using them to throw them on other people. <laughs> they're saving them for later. Yeah, there's, that's the place to go if you're looking for plastic figures is Plastic Toy Soldier Review. So, uh, they've got lots of stuff there for that. And they got a good variety of stuff. I mean, used to be way back when, one, you know, same time period, uh, early 80s, if you wanted to do something that wasn't Airfix, you only had like, I mean, there was some Italieri stuff was just coming out in the States. It may have been around a long time, but Italieri wasn't really that big in the, in the States. There was another company called, they were made in France. They were just proportioned strange. Because this thing's made in France and this thing's awesome. So... Um, not too many things hobby related come from France either. I'm not sure why. There's a decent amount of uh, war gamers in France. So um, they refer to the Art de la Guerre rules as the uh, as the French rules. I've heard people say, "Oh yeah, you play the French rules, huh? Art de la Guerre." Oh okay. Um, but yeah, the Atlantic figures they were they were really weird poses and really really um, finally. Um, uh, plastic, so it'd be really hard to uh, to paint. Yeah, I grew up on that one seventy second scale stuff. So let's make sure I don't leave any comment unturned. Let's see what we got here. Okay, nothing else. Okay, feel free to ask questions or you know if if you have something. So we're almost done with uh, doing this. As you can see, it's. It takes a while, and um, you know you want to avoid. You don't want to paint over this guy that you just spent a couple hours doing. So you need to be careful around the legs here and stuff, or you're just going to end up kicking yourself. And of course, each successive stage will be quicker than this first one because this one you want to get everywhere. You want to get this this stage everywhere. And I do paint the edges, even though they're not going to end up in this brown color. Uh, at least I kind of use this brown as a primer for the black edging that I like to do because I like the way it looks. That um, when it's uh, I like the black edging in it. So So hopefully by now most of you have watched the video that uh, put out 
came out yesterday morning that we filmed on Friday morning. Got three battles, lots of shooters. So if you guys are interested in finding out about how to use shooters in DBA, uh, you might want to check that out. It's called Dark in the Skies. So we actually run, ran an event called Dark in the Skies at one of the convention, but we, our, we set the limit as only four shooters. This one was six. So you're going to have lots of opportunities to see um, things flying in the air and people on the receiving end. I'm, uh, I'm pretty partial to shooting armies. Uh, I like them. Even in the last couple of videos that we've done theme-wise, we've had not very many shooters. Um, but that's okay. We try to mix things up so it's not like, oh, Romans again. Ugh. You know. And I find that if you do like a, a themed event, like you have to, have, we're going to use armies that have to have a minimum number of such and such auxilia, or a minimum number of uh, skirmishers, or a minimum number of knights, or anything like that. I think it's better because it encompasses more time periods than if we just do something that's just for book one. And then other people that aren't interested in, in book one or chariots to just kind of roll their eyes and like, oh, well, whatever, we won't watch that video. Because there's people that aren't interested in certain periods. And that's okay, you know? There's 500 and something armies. You don't have time to build them all. You need to pick and choose how you're gonna do them, so. Speaking of French, I had a, and I think I mentioned this the other night, I had a friend of mine that, uh, I don't think he plays DBA anymore, but when he did, he just, he, he did, wasn't gonna use the French. He just didn't like them. Um, and, um, but he he's just that's the way he is i mean he was like he didn't want to use pikes either i'm like i i like using everybody and being able to play from a different point of view so do you guys have any armies that you just refuse to use because of who they are i mean i, I don't know i've i've painted some terrorists recently and i'm not pro terrorist but i'll use them on the battlefield you know it's just a game thankfully you know so i pretty much use everybody i mean you know it is just a game so okay so We've got these two guys painted, uh, the first one. So this is the second one we did. So let's try to do the first one. I think it's dried enough that we can get some dry brushing action in here. We're going to try it anyways. Uh, worst case, it's uh, just one of those things. So, All right. So where is our dry brushing brush? I think we put her away. We were using it the other day and I'm back. And this guy's good for not much anything else because you can see it's uh, it's seen better days. But that's okay. When you start getting one of these smaller brushes that misbehaves, um, I just end up moving into the dry brush. You're not, now you're part of the dry brush crew, pal. You know? So, all right. So we're going to go ahead and put, um, we're going to go ahead and put this, we're going to go ahead and put this uh, U.S. field drab on the palette just so we can keep it alive long enough to pull it down here and do, do, do the dry brushing on these guys. So. I ordered them. Well, this Monday will be... No, I ordered them on Sunday. I ordered them on Sunday two weeks ago, and I still hadn't gotten a notification that they've shipped, which is really unusual. But they did tell me they were kind of busy, so I'm not going to be concerned. Um, I got lots of other things to do. I got to finish these guys up, then we'll go back and do all the Gallo Glass guys, and then if we're done with them, and we don't have the, and it's basically the mounted to make up the Irish. So, um, you know, we've got a couple stands of two, three stands of Scots I can do uh, for the options in this army. Uh, one of them, including a Knight General. Um, We've got um, some auxilia we can paint for these guys, and uh, we got some allies I'm gonna paint. And then, by certainly by then, the mounted just come in. So I don't think it's gonna hold up my pro process, but it did. It, it is going to change the way I order things because normally, normally I don't want to order them at the beginning of the project because I want to use. I don't want to like get the figures in and then end up not working on the army, and then I just ordered extra figures for for no avail. Um, but in this one, for whatever reason, I decided to order them before they were done. 
Uh, and it's a good thing I did because then had I not done that, I'd be sitting here at the end waiting on them to arrive. Um, I don't want to move to another army without them, uh, without them being completed. So I don't mind doing other little options for um, this army, but I don't want to move on to, to do something else. At most, I'll go back and do the, uh, the mounted for my knights, my knights for the uh, Russians, which I didn't finish that army. I had to do them for a tournament at one of my conventions, and um, I wasn't going to get them done in time, so I ended up using the Ostrogoths knights in front of them. Now, all the Russian foot is done, but um, I believe they have five stands of knights, including the commander, and I've got like five of the figures done, or maybe seven figures done, so I still have a few more figures to do. But I've already played the army and won a tournament with them um, using the other figures for the knights, so I kind of, I kind of lost steam as soon as that, that that happened but to be honest with you not having a convention anywhere near in sight like i don't know when the hell we're going to go uh not because we don't want to go to one but they're just not being held but with none of them in sight i'm getting more done these days than i ever have so you know maybe i'm just going to change the way i operate and not build things for tournaments but actually build stuff that i want to and then you know when i get around finishing them We'll film them. I guess I've got uh, I've got like 31 armies, so I've got enough that I can pretty much do any army I already have in a tournament or a theme tournament. Um, so I'm not so concerned about getting things done uh, for a particular event. Instead, I'm going to be working on things that are uh, more fun or might make good videos. So that's what these guys. These guys are mainly built for uh, the fact that we can do. Um, them uh, in an open. We can play them against their enemies. You know, uh, lots of stuff to do. So, uh, really looking forward to it. And uh, I'm sure you guys will see these guys on a battlefield. Although it may end up taking, uh, what are we, mid August? Well, they'll be done before St. Patrick's Day. That's for sure. 2021. You know, if we're allowed to celebrate that <laughs> next year. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a lot more things done when I'm just kind of painting and doing videos like this. And maybe you guys will find something useful. That my whole purpose of doing these videos to begin with was to make sure that people didn't get discouraged by looking at the rule book for DBA 3.0 and going, oh, I, who the hell plays this? You can't make any sense out of it. Well, there's lots of us that, do, that play it. And there's lots of us that are really excited and think this rule set's pretty cool. So that was mainly my main purpose to, to kind of do that. Um, I've bought the rule book. I've tried to teach the rules to other people and understand that it is one hell of an uphill climb. Some of the battles that Mitch and I do, and, um, and is, they're a lot of fun to film because there's some zany things that happen um, that nobody would believe unless you saw them unfolding before your very eyes. So um, anyhow. So that's kind of the purpose for my channel is just to make sure that, um, you know, people are aware of how much fun we're having with these, uh, with these silly little toys. So, and we're going to dry brush some on these rocks. Now, if you guys saw my video earlier, these are, this is actual granite. Uh, they're actually granite pieces. So don't chew these or, um, you're going to need dentures. Yeah, granite will beat the shit out of a goat's teeth. So, <laughs> you don't want to be chewing on this stuff. This is... All right, so we're done with that stage. Let's go and we will give it a rinse. Because we don't, we don't want to do some kind of a permutation between colors. We want it to just be these three colors so that it's easier to match in the future, you know, because so all the, you put all the bases together in the army, it looks like it, it belongs together. This is the Iraqi sand. I don't know why they decided to call it that, but I'm sure it's, uh, I bet if you looked at the sand in Iraq, it wouldn't that wouldn't be that color. <laughs> it's just a name. Just 
Just a name. All right, let's do this slightly around here. There we go. And we are going to have to get in there closer to the feet with a smaller brush than this one. Because we don't want to get this up on the side. If we were doing something like a vehicle, we wouldn't care so much that it would splash up. Actually, we would encourage it. But, yeah, you don't need this. Um, just splash it up on the uh, figure's legs. All right, we're going to come back to this one, but we want to go ahead and get all the dry brushing done with the, with the dry brush thrust. Because we're going to get in between the legs here. We won't be using this one. We're going to be using one that's uh, uh, a lot, lot smaller. So, Okay. So we should have a DBA game tomorrow night, but we're not going to film it because it's too many people. That's why we did the filming on Friday night. So, um, but I will bring my filming stuff. So if someone doesn't show up and we only have three players, then we'll film that one as well. So I want to film. I'd rather film than not film. So you just I can't do having uh, four people. Playing round robin generates six games, and we can't play six games one at a time. Not on a weeknight. Yeah, work to do the next day. And not the at home kind either. Soaked up a lot of radiation from the sun today, so I may start getting a little sluggish. Okay, so we've done uh, that part. Now let's take a smaller brush. Maybe this one. Doesn't have to be too small, but it does need to be smaller. figures with the terrain.
Yeah, I'm going to be going to bed early tonight for sure. No doubt about it. Either that or drink a gallon of coffee. But then I'm going to be, that'll keep me up. And I don't want to stay up late on a, on a work night. Okay. <sighs> Man. Let's just get in here and do some close up work. Okay, so John Peter said, uh, actually, wargaming started with the Prussians, but after losing two world wars, it's lost some of its appeal here. <laughs> well, maybe third time is the charm. No, no, no I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Um, yeah, the first one doesn't get played as much. And it probably has to do with that trench warfare thing, but though the naval stuff is fun. Yeah, World War One. I, I call that the war that should have never been fought. That was just a, well, all, all wars are a shame, but that one in particular. Found out an interesting thing the other day. You got, you probably already know it since uh, you're, you're German, but the highest scoring U-boat ace was actually a World War One U-boat ace. He was in the Mediterranean, so he actually sunk the most times than uh, anybody in World War II, so. I found that out the other day. I, I've read quite a bit of uh, World War I naval stuff, but not really the stuff that focused on the, on the U-boats in World War I, so that was kind of a surprise to me. Uh, World War I means about all the, you know, the battle cruisers and the battleships and all that kind of stuff. That's the, the glamorous stuff, so. Um, as a matter of fact, that's the, I think one of the things that has appeal of that period and earlier more than World War II because, you know, if you're playing naval war games, in my opinion, aircraft carriers ruin everything. That's the purpose of us being there is to have big guns. You start throwing uh, aircraft in a situation and then you start, you know, getting enemies that don't see each other or avoiding the point. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so John Peter says, I started out with Airfix HO, soft plastic figures. I thought they were well sculpted, but despite scribing them, if you painted them, the paint would just flake off, and it was a waste of time. Exactly. Uh, I was surprised to see shooters hiding behind terrain. I guess I'm more aggressive. If you're a shooter, get out there and shoot. Um, I have lost many games in when I was learning DBA from just attacking everywhere. You want to pick where you can win. So, um, anyhow, uh, but you know, you need to play the way you want to play, not necessarily the way I want to play. Uh, John Peter also says, I think the bases are an extremely part, extremely important part of the element. 
If you look at the figures from a distance, the bases actually stand out, especially if they will wow if they are wildly painted. I, I agree. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of those with patches of snow. I didn't know about the top U boat ace. Aha! So I was wrong, assuming that because you were German, you knew about that. I guess that would be the same thing as if you talk to somebody from the United States. Okay, if you used me for example. Okay, I'm. I'm, uh, I live in the United States, but I'm not a fan of United States history. So I may have a period that I'm really not interested in um, that someone from maybe Europe knows. So um, I just assumed that um, people in, in other countries knew about that. But that's, that's my own fault. Um, but you want to know something really cool about World War I? One of the most interesting things I've read. So there's... There's a book. Let me see if I can find it. I'm not good about reading books because they put me to sleep. Okay. Um, and I read it on Audible, and I'm not sure if this is exact, exactly the same book. This may be the same book on Audible, but it's a very similar uh, book. Uh, actually, it's not this one. But it's a very similar book to uh, Graf Spee's Raiders, World War I. Of course, you know who Graf Spee is. Everybody should know who he is. But anyways, uh, East Asia Squadron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have this book, but I think the one that I read was um, on Audible or had read to me called The Kaiser's Pirates. Basically, it covers the same thing, early war period, and it covers not only Graf Spee's squadrons, but also... Uh, surface Raiders and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it actually isn't the book. I got this book for my brother-in-law um, and several years ago and never got around to reading it because reading's too relaxing. But that The Kaiser's Pirates, I believe, is what the name of that, that book is. It is superb, okay? And along with normal things that it would talk about with Graf Space Raiders and all that kind of stuff, it talks about some really interesting stuff that would make incredible scenarios or an, I'd say incredible movie, but you know, Hollywood and Hollywoods and other countries would also ruin it, is um, one of the cruisers that was in Graf Spee's uh, squadron that came from, uh, that was based in, uh, well, it was originally based in Sintao, but uh, then they came and rejoined like four or five ships, fought, fought the Battle of Cornell, came around the corner to, um, around the bottom part of uh, Cape Horn uh, and fought in the Battle of Falklands and got decimated and they scattered. Uh, they, the two big ships got, the Sean Horst and Eisenhower got uh, decimated, but the little ships scattered and they got hunted down in different ways. One of them in particular, and I hope I don't get it wrong, I believe it's the Dresden, light cruiser Dresden, did this thing where it was trying to escape all through like all the channels in Tierra del Fuego and all that kind of stuff. Just some really epic, like crazy hiding, hide and seek type action. It was just Naval War Gamer, even though I really haven't done a lot reading of that period. I tend to like to read about things that are, I'd say, more evenly balanced. So as soon as I do something, you know, I'm not really interested in really one-sided affairs. So uh, Cornell was kind of one-sided in favor of the Germans. And uh, Falklands is even more in favor of the of the English, so I tend to not read those kind of things. But uh, I just had that book, decided to uh, read it. On, I had it read to me on Audible. It's an excellent book, uh, and that was one of the that was one of the things that it talked about was the exploits of the Dresden trying to escape back into the Pacific from uh, from uh, the Battle of uh, the Falklands that it had. Uh, escape from and it was really interesting that it talks about all these bays and of course I'm trying to find them on the map and they're unmarked and just that'd make a great movie except when they make movies war movies they ruin them all as you well know in my opinion and people that are real you know real particular about that kind of stuff you know um, but that's was some fascinating stuff fascinating stuff actually Another thing that's really interesting, and I've, I've read several books on, on World War I, sank in World War I compared to World War II were, tr I mean, they sank more in World War II, but they were tremendously successful in World War I. 
probably because of you know the lack of countermeasures against them. You know, because when they started at the beginning of the war, like you, there was no sonar, there was no depth charges, or you know, eventually those things started getting developed. But uh, yeah, they racked up some pretty impressive numbers in World War One for sure. But um, but anyhow, interesting things. Um, okay, I think we're done with uh, with this. We're going to see if um, we're going to paint the edges and then we're going to stop because I don't want to do any of the tuftage or any of the grass while the edges are still wet because you don't want any of these of those particles to get stuck into the side of the stand and, and ruin that. So um, okay. put that away because we don't use the wet palette for any of that. We get our crappy black paint. Our El Cheapo black paint that's really, really cheap, and if I'm wasteful, I don't, I don't feel so bad about it. Okay, and that is good old folk art. This is like a dollar for this huge thing, and it's not the same quality. It's uh, it has some gummy type properties. In other words, uh, you apply it, and it it looks very um, elastic, I should say. And um, yeah, well, we're not gonna use a wet palette. We're gonna put some black paint here or here and, um, and just paint from that. Because um, all we're gonna do is trim the edges in black so that it looks, uh, looks like a nice playing piece. I enjoy black on the edges. So uh, I thought at one point to color code them maybe by army, but I don't think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go that route, you know, into that, so. Um, Okay, so John Peter says, you read Dreadnought. It has a lot of information about activities that lead to World War I. Sarajevo was just the opportunity that was used to start the war. Very interesting. So I have Dreadnought on, um, on Kindle, and I started reading it, and... Um, oh, we got a taste test? Yeah. We get it close? Yeah, In, uh, about 10 minutes. About 10 minutes? Okay, I'm going to finish the edging then, and then I've got a break for the food that um that we that we dove for scallops so we got scallops on the menu here base scallops that uh we went scalloping today but yes so i was saying i have it on the kindle and i took a cruise maybe three years ago and i started reading it and made it through a couple of chapters and it was very interesting but i just fall asleep when i read books so on Audible, they do not, uh, so that's part of a series, Dreadnought, and the second one is called Castles of Steel. So Dread, Dreadnought leads up to building the Dreadnought, and Castles of Steel, I assume, picks up where that one leaves off and covers like all the World War I battles. Um, and I have that one on Audible and listen to it, and it's, it's awesome. The only gripe I have about it is I think it's that one, or maybe it's the one that's book written by Jut, uh, about Jutland. It's written by the grandson of Jellico. It might be both. When they talk about things in distance, they'll say it so and so many meters, and then they'll turn around and say it in so and so many yards. And it's like really awkwardly paced when they talk about things like that. Yards, meters, if you want to use meters, that's fine. United States is not a we're not metric friendly. I don't have a problem with metric stuff, but the general population like freaks out if things are in metric. So I don't know if that's why they did it, um, but it just makes the reading kind of awkward, but because Dreadnought's not available on Audible. So, hey, look, I made a mess. Uh, it's always these big, chunky, yucky bat, uh, bottles that do that. So let's pick this up quick so that I don't miss out on dinner. And because uh, that would be rude. Um, anyhow, so yes, I I imagine the dreadnought is very good, but um, but I have not read it to completion because the books just put me to sleep. Um, it makes my they make my eyes tired, and. The story isn't interesting enough to keep me awake to counter that. 
but the second one's awesome. So I imagine the first one's awesome as well. Just didn't get through to it. So. Interesting thing about the Dreadnought, you may already know this. The Dreadnought was not at, at uh, Jutland. But it was the only battleship that is known to sink a, destroy, uh, to sink a uh, submarine by ramming. The submarine it rammed was commanded by a U-boat ace. And I don't remember what his name is. Shame on me. Um, but... He is the guy who is famous on U-9 at the beginning of World War I for sinking those three armored cruisers. I don't remember when it surfaced and the Dreadnought rammed it. So I believe Dreadnought is the only battleship, the only capital ship known for sinking an enemy submarine. So that was really interesting when I read that. And I'm not sure that it's in that in Castles of Steel or not. It was an earlier book, but that one always struck me, you know. Is it Vettinger? I think that U-boat captain might be Vettinger. That might be what it is. Anyways, he's the one that's fa that's famous for uh he ran into the channel and he sank like three old Abu Kir, and I don't remember what the last one is. Maybe Hogue? Man, if I know that, I just retain all kinds of useless information. <laughs> I believe that's what the names of the three crew cruisers are, the three armored cruisers. But, uh, yeah, they were kind of on patrol or whatever. Well, that U-boat captain, of course, he did other things. He was commanding a different U-boat. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, Dreadnought. Rammed it and sank it. You know, U-boat, you, you don't want to get sunk by anything. You don't want to get hit by anything when you're in a U-boat. It just compromises the... The structural integrity and and you can't dive at all so we're just going to paint around this and then we're going to have to wait till a little bit later let this dry and uh, then we'll do the tuftage we'll probably come on on video and do that or attempt to do that and um, although I've done that in an earlier video, but I'm like, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. So why the hell not film it? As long as you guys don't mind the background noise. I'm in my own room here. But, you know, my daughter had some uh, friends over and stuff like that. So, you know, they're less than quiet. So my own, fortunately, have my own room to do this, uh, you know, sound travels and so forth. So I think this is the last edge we got to do. Okay, and right. Uh, okay, so John Peter says, the story about the British and French in Africa is a really interesting part of that book. We're talking about Dreadnought. It clarifies why those two countries were no longer traditional enemies and that worried the Germans. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how it's seen in other countries as far as who the aggressor is of World War I. Um, I don't want to get into something political, but I have a feeling that in the United States, most people view the Germans as the bad guys. I never did. It was kind of like nobody should have been fighting in the first place. Um, and I think it would have been a lot better if the U.S. had not entered the war. And, but anyhow, that's a topic for another discussion. I don't, you know, um, war is stupid and doesn't really solve anything. But, um, but yeah, I don't view the Germans as the bad guys in World War I at all. So, um, but anyhow, um, that's, uh, that's that. So, 
Um, we are going to uh, come back to this when it's time to do the tuftage. Um, if I didn't have dinner, I still wouldn't be able to do the next stage, so that didn't interfere or anything. But we'll be back a little bit later tonight, and um, assuming I'm awake. Uh, it's 7, just shy of 7.35 here on Sunday night, so maybe in a couple hours uh, we can do some tuftage, even in a short video, and uh, pick some of that stuff out for you guys and, and, and finish the last two uh, kerns. So that'll, that'll be exciting to do that. So anyhow... Uh, we will see you guys later, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, watching this. And uh, don't forget to link, like and subscribe uh, if you enjoyed uh, this content so we can keep bringing you more. All right, folks. See you guys later. Bye-bye.